My name is Marcus Dolov. I work with Tron on, on Stacks. Um, and uh, we're going to start right now with the 10 startups that we'll be presenting. Each startup will be talking for three minutes. Uh, just enough to give you uh, an overview and understanding of uh, what they do, their um, superior technological approach, and uh, early results as well. And then the idea is that you'll seek them out afterwards and their um, you know, poster boards outside so you can find them. And so there, there will actually not be any Q&A. Uh, we'll just uh, stick to the presentations. Um, first speaker is John D'Souza, uh, CEO and founder of Ample. Uh, John has a bachelor's and master's from MIT in computer science and electrical engineering, and Ample does battery swapping for electric vehicles. So, John. Oh, good morning. It's fun to be the first. <laughs> uh, so at Ample, we focus on the autonomous delivery of, electric, uh, of energy to electric cars. So if you take a step back, we're at an inflection point with electric cars right now where electric cars have three things going for them. The cars are as good enough as gas cars. Uh, you have all the major OEMs that are spending millions of dollars going through in manufacturing uh, dedicated electric cars. And a lot of the governments are spending a tremendous amount of money going through and pushing them. The issue that you have with electric cars is that the infrastructure isn't that great. <laughs> uh, the best solution that we have right now is fast charging. Fast charging still costs a tremendous amount. You're paying eighty to $100,000 per fast charger. It can take a long time to build because it is an infrastructure project. They're inefficient. For every, uh, for if you put energy into a Tesla, you use about 30% of that in heat. Uh, and you get all these demand charges, uh, spikes in charges. Even if it, that does work, if you don't have a garage to park it overnight, it still doesn't work well for you because uh, you have to spend two to four hours at a fast charger every week. So if we, so when we, let's see. So we actually went back to an old concept. Battery swapping has been around for a, a very long time, and it's actually very active in China right now. Uh, they do it manually, uh, but they swap it, uh, uh, you know, they, they manage to swap it with all these uh, uh, cranes and other things that help them. Uh, but if you can get battery swapping to work, you can get it done in three to five minutes regardless of capacity. Uh, you can move the batteries very quickly into it. You can charge the batteries slower, which are better for the batteries. You don't hit all these uh, 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 peak charges. So a lot of benefits if you can get it done. But the main thing is you can now get electric or batteries to work with fleets, autonomous vehicles, and people who don't have garages. So you open the market and extend it a tremendous amount. So we came up with a solution that has three components to it. We have a smart modular battery uh, that allows us to fit in a number of modules depending on the capacity of the car or the truck that you're working with. We've developed an autonomous uh, robot that can go underneath the car and, and uh, swap out the batteries without you actually building any infrastructure into the ground. And then we have a, a battery dispenser that actually dispenses the battery. I won't go into a lot of details on the robot and all, but I will spend time on just on the battery. Uh, so the battery for us is a key component. We actually developed a, a patented technology to allow us to use software control of power electronics. So we can use the same module across different cars and, and uh, trucks and all. So we solved the key problem there. We can get these to work with cars without requiring any changes to the cars, which is the second key thing uh, that we want to go through and, uh, and do there. And the third is we can actually go through and use different chemistries in existing cars. So solve a lot of problems out there. From an economic perspective, it's very interesting because we can actually go through, each swapping station only costs us $25,000 to go through and build, which is on a per car basis is 50 to 100 times cheaper than existing solutions out there. Uh, we can deploy an entire city for a million dollars versus a gas station costing you a million dollars. Uh, and we can get it done in three to six weeks. We're profitable on, a three, on uh, 300 cars. So we started two years ago. We actually have a, a system that's up and operational in the process of doing partnerships, looking for OEMs, tier one manufacturers, uh, you know, uh, different types of uh, companies across the board. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John. All right, so next speaker is Dana Guernsey, uh, uh, Director of Corporate Development from uh, Ambry. And Ambry is uh, building a liquid metal battery technology invented at MIT. Get this and that. All right. And stay in there. Got it. All right, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for having me today. I'm Dana Guernsey. I'm Director of Corporate Development at Ambry. Ambry uh, is an MIT spin-out company as of 2010 based on the work at Professor Don Sadoway's lab. Uh, we're developing a new energy storage battery technology for the grid. Um, so why energy storage? Uh, 
I show this image, it's not energy storage, but I want to take a step back for a moment and think about the electricity grid being designed for peak demand rather than average demand. So imagine if our roads and infrastructures were built in this manner. Uh, we'd have the Mass Pike running 20 lanes wide just to serve the need for a Fenway game. Uh, and that would be wildly uh, wasteful when it comes to our capital resources, infrastructure, and energy, and everything that goes into building that. But that is, in fact, how our electric grid is built today. It's built to meet that peak demand. So energy storage can fundamentally change the grid, uh, which is also the largest supply chain without warehouses, if you think about it that way. So Ambry's technology, we're developing the liquid metal battery. And what makes the liquid batter metal battery excuse me, unique uh, is our low cost and long lifespan. So thinking about designing for the grid all along, Ambry's technology will will not fade the way that similar technologies do, such as lithium ion, which is in most of our smartphones here today. We're probably all familiar with the capacity fade in that. Uh, and we project that over 15 to 20 years, so really decades of life, the battery will retain 98% of its capacity. When we think about markets, uh, we think about a lot of applications for energy storage, but one that interests us the most actually is thinking about pairing solar with storage and renewables with storage at large. And what that can really do is create a firm 24-7 dispatchable, 100% renewable resource that is uh, cost effective and um, much cleaner than the fossil alternatives. So thank you for your interest. Um, Ambry, as an ask, is looking uh, for future partnerships. We're still in a research and development mode. Uh, but in the future, we'd be looking for partnerships with energy storage integrators, uh, energy storage developers, and manufacturing strategic partners globally. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Uh, next speaker is Mackenzie King, VP of Product Development at uh, Solid Energy System, which is reinventing the battery for uh, mobile phones, drones, and electric vehicles. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Mackenzie King, VP of Product Development at Solid Energy, spin out from Professor Donald Sadaway's lab in 2013. Uh, this is a battery with wings. It is the lightest rechargeable battery around. We call it Hermes, high energy rechargeable metal cell designed for aerospace and aeronautics. It is our first product and it wants to fly. This battery is very enabling for a lot of new technologies. Uh, in particular, if you want to take your flying taxi to work in the morning, that's much lower stress. But also, uh, we're also enabling currently high altitude pseudo satellites working at the edge of space, bringing internet to low density population areas, specifically internet to small rural communities where children can get educated. Uh, we're looking at UAVs. They can deliver medical resources to cut off or uh, remote areas. And uh, potentially, we're looking at putting men back on the moon, and this is the ideal uh, technology for that application, going back to Mars or exploration elsewhere. So before I show you some data, I just wanted to share this graph with you. There's a lot of battery startups there out there. A lot of them have failed. They haven't uh, delivered on their promises. And so it's a minefield for investors. And this graph uh, is a plot of uh, energy density versus specific energy. And there's a line drawn through it. Think of it as Moore's law for batteries. It's not, not completely equivalent. And what you'll see on that line is a number of the technologies uh, that have come along being adopted. And each of these technologies gets adopted because it introduces a paradigm shift in the energy density uh, capability. Things like cycle life, safety, cost, they all get worked on after the new disruption has been adopted. There's a number of technologies that fall below 400 watt hours per kilogram. They're good technologies, they're interesting, but they fall below that, uh, that magic number that a lot of our uh, customers are interested in. Lithium sulfur, solid state polymers, uh, ceramic batteries. And uh, what we really wanted to do at Solid Energy was look at the next leapfrog, uh, leapfrog technology, really stay on that line. 
This is data from a customer. It's a major aerospace customer. They'd been working on a program for 12 years, making very incremental small improvements because the battery technology was limiting. They took our battery, they put it in, and now that program is full steam ahead. Uh, it's got a good return on investment for them. And uh, the quote there is, they think we're time travelers. We've come back from the future to help them. Great. I'm interested in human capital, investment capital, or if you want to talk about our products, I'd also love to chat with you. Thank you. Next speaker is David Eaglesham, uh, CEO and uh, co-founder of Pelion Technologies, which is bringing a magnesium ion battery to market for uh, drone applications, among others. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so, I, so I, I want to start with a question, by the way. How am I supposed to disrupt an industry if I stay inside the white lines? <laughs> so, so, uh, so uh, Pelion Technology, so we're going to, um, I, I want to actually talk just about a lot of startup companies are, are trying to sell you on a technology. I'm actually just going to try to sell you on a product. Talk, so I'll only talk about product performance and um, performance attributes. I actually won't talk about the, tech, the underlying technology at all. Um, technology, uh, the company was originally founded out of uh, Gerd Cedar's lab. Okay, uh, so, so here's, here's the market opportunity. Market opportunity sits in flight, um, or at least one of these. Those. This is your classic uh, zero trillion dollar uh, market. Um, the, the thing, electric flight, in my opinion, is ready to happen in terms of controls, in terms of all, all the other pieces. The battery is the thing that prevents this from happening. So Elon Musk has this uh, quote where he says, I'll build an electric jet um, if you give me something that's 400 watt hours per kilogram. Coincidentally, we're north of that number. Um, more relevantly, maybe from my perspective, I'm running a startup and I can't wait for electric flight and the regulatory stuff that's going to happen for manned electric flight. And so more relevantly, um, the drone application is here and now, and the drone application is already, there's like two billion bucks worth of uh, drones were sold in 2016, of which about 30% was batteries. So the drone application is easily big enough for us to go, uh, to go and drive early adoption. That's our early adopter market. Eventually, electric, manned electric flight is going to come along. Okay, um, so, uh, so this is the product. This is the product that we have. Uh, again, I'm just going to talk about performance here, and, and I'm not going to talk about lab performance. I'm not going to talk about um, test data. I only want to talk about solving real problems for an actual device in the field. Right? So this is the, uh, the flight of a drone. So we take our batteries, we weld them together, we stick them in a drone, and you can fly this drone for twice as long as anybody else's battery. Um, that is value, is value to the customer, it's value in an application where I can make money. Um, so uh, this is the sort of the, the uh, early application space. This is showing demo flights that, that uh, we've run, and we run these demo flights for a number of customers. Okay, here's the discharge curves. This is showing the, the, the discharge to the thing, and again, this is just showing um, that we are able to, to uh, fly a drone for twice as long. This demo, by the way, gets me in the door with every drone customer in the world and with other people who have other applications. Okay, so the ask, um, we're interested in other applications that go beyond drones. And I think maybe the, the, the ask here is, we, we have a pretty high performance uh, battery and we're looking at other applications beyond the drones. I, I know all the guys in drones. I, I'm, I actually don't know all the other guys in other applications. So 460 watt hours per kilo, 1400 watt hours per liter, those are, those are lab numbers. Um, rates to 10 C, 1,000 uh, watts per kilo on a power level, and uh, uh, cycle life from 100 to 250. Cycle life is probably our weakest metric, but that's our, uh, that's our pitch. So the pitch is uh, we, we have a, a battery that works, I think, really well. We're looking for folks who are interested in running demos and, uh, and customer applications in that space. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you, David. Uh, just a quick uh, disclaimer, uh, just to clarify what we're doing here. We're helping startups partner with uh, industry corporations. We're not, <coughs> excuse me, an investment broker. So this is not, <coughs> excuse me, a traditional sort of uh, investment pitch uh, session. Um, next speaker is Matt, uh, Matt Lassarevich, uh, CEO and co-founder of Helix Power. 
He holds a bachelor's and a master's in mechanical engineering from MIT, as well as an MBA from Sloan. And uh, Helix, Helix is building a power burst management platform for transit applications, among others. I'm Matt Lazarevich, president of um, I'm Matt Lazarevich Helix of uh, uh, pre president of Helix Power, and what and what we're what we're what we'll be talking about is using regenerative brakings on subway systems uh, to cut consumption of, uh, of energy for the train systems literally in half. What we're talking about here is is uh, we'll be using the 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 New York MTA system as a case study. Uh, it's, if, if you look at it, it's, a, it's the largest consumer of electricity in New York City. More than that, it's, it's, it's also, and, we're, and we, the, the trains on our side is what it shows, it weighs about a million pounds, and it's supposed to behave kind of like a hybrid car does in, 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 uh, in, in operation, so that so we can save a lot of money that way. However, however t today, 50% of the energy that's, re that's put into, this, into the subway system is literally thrown away in braking, just dumped as heat. So the thing is, so, the, so right now, it's all, all that energy is wasted. Regenerated energy can be recycled, and what, we, and what we're talking about is about a terawatt of, uh, terawatt of uh, watt hours a year, uh, 100 to 200 million dollars a, a year of, of savings. We can put in tremendous savings in greenhouse gases and CO2. Now, what we're talking now, now the the solution that we're using is is uh, is a uh, is a flywheel based system. The, uh, for anybody who doesn't know what it is, we'll talk about it later. You know, we'll talk about that outside here. But the power management requirements are this: that this storage device needs to uh, to take a million uh, take a megawatt and base and, reci and recycle it 150 times a day. So the, so so it, if for it to last for 20 years to be practical, it has to be able to handle a million cycles, 100% depth of discharge all the time. So so it, uh, with a 20-year life. So the, the so what, what what this really shows you, if you think about what re, what it's required for bulk storage, this is a very different system, and they're not compatible here at all, uh, uh, to work to work with each other. So where we are is we chose to use the metro system. Here, these are different markets that are out there. It's a $10 billion market today, growing to be a $25 billion market when we look at subway system growth in, uh, in, in China. Uh, other things like mining and heavy industrial uh, applications will all be coming next. And those are all, and those are all, um, those, uh, those, those are all very high, uh, highly fr uh, s s cycling and, um, uh, fluctuating uh, uh, loads on it. So, so come, uh, come and see. Come and see me. We'll describe a little bit more about it. Great. Thank you, Matt. Uh, next speaker is uh, Joe Adileta, who's the senior director of products at 24M. 24M is a startup co-founded by Professor uh, Yetming Chang, one of the foremost uh, battery researchers in the world. Um, so. And we're off. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Joe Adeletta, Senior Director of Products uh, at 24M, uh, where we are reinventing uh, lithium ion. Um, we're doing this uh, via a, let's see, over this way. There we go. Um, via a rethink of the manufacturing process. When Professor Yetming Chang, uh, MIT, Professor Craig Carter, MIT, and serial entrepreneur Troop Wilder uh, founded the company, they did so with the thought that uh, traditional lithium-ion battery manufacturing technology relies on a bunch of legacy processes that were uh, very expensive, time-consuming, space-consuming. Uh, so by rethinking it, uh, we get two primary advantages. Um, the first is a structural, structural bill of materials uh, advantage. Simply put, we use less stuff. The process enables us to use thick electrodes, uh, the schematic there over on the left, which means less copper, less aluminum, less separator, traditionally some of the more expensive materials inside a lithium ion cell. Additionally, we're removing a lot of the large capital intensive equipment radically reducing the overall footprint uh, of the line installation. 
And next slide. So what does that mean? Uh, fundamentally, it means a bill of materials cost reduction somewhere in the 25 to 30 percent range. Uh, it also means that from a capital investment perspective, we are roughly half uh, per megawatt hour of throughput for, uh, for a manufacturing facility. Another key point here is that in order to reach economies of scale, we need roughly 20%, one-fifth of the traditional throughput seen in, in a manufacturing facility. So if you think about it, instead of 500 megawatt hours or a gigafactory per se, we can get by with 100 megawatt hours to reach that economy of scale. What that means when you couple it with the reduced capital requirement, you can get into the business for as little as, say, $10 million, as opposed to the $100, $200, $300 $300 dollars required in a traditional facility. So anytime you can say you need an order of magnitude less capital to get started, we think that's really compelling. What we're looking for uh, is global manufacturing partnerships from corporations that are considering make versus buy decisions for their lithium ion products and or systems that at the end of the day want to avail themselves of many of the benefits that you see here, whether it's localized production, um, whether it's customized solutions, whether it's security of supply. So come find me afterwards. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Joe. Next speaker is John Cooley, COO and founder at FastCap. Uh, he, John holds uh, five technical degrees from MIT, including a PhD uh, in electrical engineering, uh, and FastCap is energy storage for extreme conditions. All right. I was interested to see which version of slides we got. So, um, John Cooley, president, FastCap Systems. We actually, I founded, um, co-founded FastCap in 2009 out of MIT. Uh, we were both, both finishing our PhDs at the time. Um, we were initially funded by DOE for advanced nanostructured carbon uh, electrodes for high performance ultra capacitors at the time for clean energy applications, which were mostly automotive. Um, since then, we've made a great deal of advancement in a number of uh, performance um, expanding initiatives for ultra capacitors, including energy density and power density. Um, high voltage, but also um, we've really gotten commercial in um, expanding the sort of environmental um, um, tolerances on ultracapacitors. So we have the highest temperature ultracapacitor on the market. That's a commercial product. Um, we're also able to adjust the temperature uh, window of this technology so we can provide for uh, very wide temperature ultracapacitor products and also ruggedized high shock and vibration um, products as well. Um, historically, ultracapacitors have been limited by some of their performance um, metrics, uh, energy power, but also environmental uh, conditions, and so this opens up new markets and applications. There was actually an MIT News article written about this concept. Our first um, market was oil and gas, and that's where we really developed the harsh environment technology. We're commercial there uh, with a high temperature ultracapacitor shown in the picture. Customers are oil field service companies. Um, we're also uh, very active in aerospace and defense as a derivative of the harsh environment technology, which we were able to transfer. Um, those defense contractors are very interested in um, structural and um, custom form factor, also wide temperature range ultra capacitors were funded by NASA to do some space-based technology there. Um, and what's interesting is that the harsh environment technology and the sort of, the, the way that that opens up um, new applications has led us to now a volume application in data centers. Um, we've discovered that we're able to build the first tr truly surface mountable reflowable ultra capacitor. Uh, so that will be coming on the market in 2018 um, for SSD applications or solid state hard drives. So our ask is um, basically about feedback on product market fit. Um, if you um, need high power, long life, or wide temperature rechargeable energy storage. Um, we'd like to hear about that. Um, and also, more specifically, where have you tried to use ultra capacitors in the past, but have run into limitations in things like temperature and lifetime? Um, process automation is the next big one. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, next speaker is Sanjay Gupta, VP of Product Management at Whitricity. And uh, actually, a quick story. Ten years ago, I was working at Nokia, and we talked about how it should be obvious that we should be able to charge our mobile phones wire wirelessly. 
And so Wittricity is now making that a reality, not only for mobile phones, but also for electric vehicles. Thank you. Okay, I'll try and stay within the box here. Uh, so, you know, we're talking a lot about uh, batteries, right? And what I really want us to reflect on is how do we deliver power to these batteries, right? You know, it's uh, charging these batteries is a very stressful process and something that is not natural for us, right? You know, we all think about, oh, my cell phone battery is running out, now I have to go get it juiced somewhere. Or I have an EV and it's going to run out of juice and I'm going to be on the highway, right? So really, Whitricity has innovated in the space of charging these, delivering energy to these batteries and doing it in a way that is very natural, right? Batteries are going to charge without what I say human intervention, right? Batteries charge by themselves during the normal course. So how do we do it? We use the phenomena of uh, you know, resonance, right? Everybody is familiar with resonance. The principle in which you can transfer energy over a long distance, whether it's the opera singer, whether it's a swing, and we use it uh, with magnetics, right? With a very, very old concept of having an oscillating current creating a magnetic, oscillating magnetic field. You put another coil in that oscillating magnetic field and you can harvest uh, a little bit of current, or AC current. We use the same principle except we design these systems to be in perfect harmony so they are in resonance, and what that allows you to do is give you certain benefits from a user experience perspective, which is really what allows us to be, just take the stress out of charging all your, uh, all your devices, right? Spatial freedom is the most important one, right? If I'm sitting with my cell phone, can it just charge sitting on the desk? Rather than what you see today, I have to precisely place it. Can I charge multiple devices at the same time, right? I have my phone, I have my laptop, I have my Bluetooth headsets, I have my EV. Can they all charge together without uh, precise placement? You know, wires are a bit of a challenge. Nobody likes wires. I really hate the clutter of wires. How can I deliver power in a very invisible way, right? How can I, ha I can have my electronics charged from something underneath my desk? So I have a very, very clean desk, for example. Right? Uh, my kitchen counter or where I charge my phones does not have any wires. I can just go put uh, my devices on my granite, my marble, my wooden counter, and they're all charging. And then I really want my devices to charge fast. I don't want to say I can only do 5 watts, 6 watts, 10 watts. And Whitricity's technology will allow you to charge from something as small as a milliwatt, a Bluetooth headset, an implantable uh, electronics device in your body, to your car. Right? Imagine an electric car that you own, you drive it into your garage, and it's charging because there is something magical in the garage floor that will charge all these, uh, your electric car. So the applications for our technology, right, in the consumer electronics space, all the consumer electronics that we carry in our bags, medical devices, imagine all of the electronics that are embedded inside our body, pacemakers, neurostimulators, that they can charge without uh, you know, going to the surgeon's office. Cool. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, automobiles we talked about. Let's see. And you know, we're very excited. The first product with our technology is launching uh, uh, in the it next 30 days. Three minutes. It's, it is indeed three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Go see him outside afterwards. Um, <laughs> Next speaker is uh, Jeff uh, Zhang, um, CEO and uh, co-founder of Novarials. Uh, he co-founded uh, this company with MIT, a PhD, Chi Zhao. Um, Novarials has produced a nanowire battery separator. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jeff Zhang uh, from Novaris Corporation. Uh, Novaris is a um, startup uh, with a technology focus on ceramic narrow wires. Uh, okay. Um, uh, everyone knows that the safety issue is a big pain of uh, high energy batteries. Here are a few examples of Tesla uh, Model S fair, um, Dreamliner 787 grounding, and uh, Samsung 
Node 7 file. Um, though this um, problem exists, but um, high energy battery are highly needed, so everyone is working very hard to make high energy battery, such as making anode as uh, positive as possible, uh, negative as possible, cathode be uh, as positive as possible, and battery separate as soon as possible. You are trying to pack everything very densely. So the whole, whole world is working very hard to make less and less safer batteries. But high energy battery has to be safe. Um, battery separator may play a big role in this um, issue, and that's a huge 2.5 billion uh, market. Um, here is our solution. At Novartis Corporation, we can make a variety of ceramic nano wires with low cost and very thin, very beautiful. See that picture? And we use that nano, nano wire, ceramic nano wire, to make um, flex, flexible and thin, pure ceramic membranes. We incorporate that into battery as a battery separator. So our solution here is that pure ceramic paper membrane as separator, which is pure ceramic, thin, and flexible. And our solution provides the full advantage, like high temperature integrity and uh, stability. Our separator is stable to 300 degrees Celsius. A high stability to high voltage cathode, high temperature operation. Actually, we run our battery at 120 degrees Celsius. That's no problem with certain anode and cathode. And long st um, term stability. Um, we are a very small startup. We're trying to uh, work with a large company that can, um, uh, would like to um, lead the competition of battery separator or would like to provide um, better um, batteries for their customers. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, our last speaker is Fran Francisco Moroch, uh, co-founder of Hela Technologies. Uh, Francisco has a master's in mechanical engineering from MIT, and Hela is uh, building a microgrid management platform. Hi, everyone. So my name is Francisco Morox. I'm one of co the co-founders of Hela Technologies. Um, and I want to talk to you about the, our distributed optimization platform for microgrids, the Hale IQ. So most of you in this room would agree, there we go, would agree that microgrids are going to play a big role, especially pushed by, by better and better storage, in this century's energy transformation. However, we have identified in the field many, many times three main factors that slow down their adoption. The first one is that equipment out there is non-standardized, so it's hard to integrate among different vendors, which limits the choice for the integrator. The second one is that complex system, the microgrids are complex systems, so even if you manage to have these systems communicate with each other, uh, having them work in harmony and at an optimal level, it's not an easy task. Um, custom solutions today cost uh, many thousands of dollars and can take months to implement. Finally, uh, microgrids are expensive to modify. Let's say you build your microgrid, you customize a solution to control it, uh, and you want to change it, that's a pain. So you have to rehire the engineers, you have to make some changes, and that can take a lot of money and time. Uh, so let me share a little bit also about how our technology tackles these issues. Uh, the Hale IQ is a local optimizer, so every subsystem in the microgrid gets, a, gets one. Uh, and together they form an intelligent la layer between the central controller and those assets. It is easy to integrate, so plug and play solution, where you don't have to, uh, you know, the person integrating the system doesn't have to worry about how to connect them and communicate them. Uh, it is flexible and robust, so it reduces engineering costs by auto balancing the system when assets are added or removed. It is able to uh, respond, respond to potentially catastrophic events that can happen at a sub-second level, right? And finally, it, it's easy to integrate with third-party softwares, uh, unlocking the door for potentially lucrative opportunities such as demand response and ancillary service markets. Uh, 
Many of these functionalities are already in place. Some of them we're still developing. Uh, but we have a pilot in California where we are integrating with all of those elements that you see, th you see there. Um, as you can see, there are a few of them, which makes controlling this microgrid particularly complex and makes it a perfect testbed for our system. Uh, a couple of key insights from that pilot. Uh, we have corroborated that, in fact, three or more asset types make a microgrid very hard to control with conv uh, conventional controllers. Uh, direct integration with vendor is key, so we are looking to partner as much as possible. And there is an active commercial need to simplify central control. We have seen that the implementation can take quite a while and be extremely expensive. So these are our two asks. Um, we're trying to build and expand our partnerships. So if you're interested in that, please look me up after this, uh, this uh, conference here. And we're looking to build new pilot projects to develop, to deploy more of our HALAS and test our more advanced um, capabilities. So thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, so we're going to take a quick break, or actually not a quick break. We're going to take a break till 10, uh, 10 o'clock this morning. And uh, for now, you can see the startups outside and uh, follow up with them. The next speaker is going to be Professor uh, Yetming Chang. So look forward to seeing you again in this room at 10 o'clock sharp. Thank you. <laughs>